Good, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, the third lecture, so uh, trying to, uh, and uh, the final lecture uh, on the unfolding method. So uh, we'll wrap up uh, what we did so far and uh, see if we can push it towards the, uh, the end. So um, the toy problem we discussed. Uh, I'll just uh, remind you um, the context and uh, what we achieved so far, and then we go from there. Where again, this is, uh, we, we consider the toy problem of the heat, uh, heat propagation, uh, the steady state heat through a composite, uh, uh, isotropic uh, composite <coughs> homogeneous uh, uh, with the different values in different materials. So uh, we uh, focused on A epsilon of this form, A of X over epsilon, with A being uh, um, a function of Y defined in the main cell. Uh, two values, uh, again, but constituent materials in our model, toy model, are um, isotropic homogeneous materials. So A1 in material one, A2 in material two. Uh, and this will be, um, uh, A will be extended by periodicity to consider and give me the whole uh, microstructure. And this will be the periodicity cell, which translates and gives the whole microstructure. Let's say that's how uh, it happens with Y1 and Y2, uh, material one, material two, and this big thing is the Y cell, okay? So this is uh, the problem we considered, and uh, we, um, we looked at the solution U epsilon. Uh, we saw uh, that you can show the solution is bounded in L2. Uh, we showed that the solution is also uh, bounded in H01. Um, we concluded uh, that the solution has a strong limit uh, based on some compactness results in L2, and uh, that there is a weak limit uh, in H1. Okay, so that's uh, what we did so far with the solution. Uh, and uh, uh, again, under the understanding of this problem was in variation of form, so in fact, the problem to uh, pass to the limit to um, is this, where I multiply with test function, uh, and this is um, for uh, every uh, psi in uh, the space of test functions with compact support, let's say in the context of zero Dirichlet data. Um, and uh, for this, we introduce the unfolding operator. Okay, and the unfolding operator was defined like this with respect to the integer part uh, uh, of X over epsilon uh, uh, on the period cell and um, in the interior set. So I'll go fast here because we cover this and zero otherwise. And once we define the unfolding operator, we proved some properties of the unfolding operator. No. Uh, some uh, elementary properties, uh, multiplicativity, okay? We proved some convergence properties which was, were uh, simple to show. So for every L2 function, we showed it for smooth functions, but the unfolding uh, of V uh, converges to V strongly in uh, strongly in uh, L2 omega cross Y, okay? 
And uh, we also saw that the same happens if T epsilon applies to strongly convergent sequences. For strongly convergent sequences in L2. These are just, uh, it's a recap, so I put it here because uh, I consider that you've seen it before, so if you don't see it very clearly now, you have no excuse, okay? So, um, what else did we prove? You, uh, would you help me with the unfolding uh, operator for the unfolding? The main, the main thing, the, the identity, uh, which will help us to take integrals on omega and unfold them into integrals on omega cross y. So, uh, the unfolding identity, yes, so integral of the unfolded would be equal with integral on um, the interior set of uh, the function, okay? That's uh, what we had, and based on this, we said that um, since this here is integral on omega minus integral on the small set, gamma epsilon, then we said, no, that I will raise this just to list what we did. We said that this will be considered to be equal with the integral on omega of phi, um, if uh, the integral of phi on the small set uh, is very, very small in the limit, yeah? Okay? So that was the convention we did. And so uh, it is uh, easy to show that you can apply unfolding in these integrals because you have bounded, and here you can use holder and the, small, the smallness of the set gamma epsilon. So uh, I assign this as a exercise for you. So to show that the variational form we're looking at, in fact, is uh, 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 transforms into an integral on omega cross y. And so this integral will be unfolded. And you can show that this indeed can be, satisfies this property, so we can unfold it. And uh, You get this for every psi in a smooth, yeah? And uh, here, we know what this is doing. Uh, T epsilon acts on highly oscillating sequences by eliminating the oscillation. So this would be just this in our toy problem, yeah? So this is what we have, where here it's on almost equality, yeah? Because we unfold it, yeah? But we know that in the limit will become equality. So anyway, just keep this in mind. Now, uh, passing to the limit here, this here converges, of course, because psi is smooth and we have uh, those converges strong. So this is a strong convergence here. We discussed that, yeah, uh, to uh, this, okay? And now the question is, what's happening to this? Uh, uh, I don't think, I, did, I, I guess that's where we left off, no? Uh, we discussed also here, besides these properties, we discussed what's happening with uh, a sequence for which the unfolding weakly converges to a limit. The sequence will converge to the average of the limit, but uh, it's really not relevant in this process. Uh, and at this point, we have one question. What up, what's up with this? So about this, we know something. There is, there is something which we deduced from here. There is an inequality which uh, we proved that T epsilon uh, of V is bounded by the norm of V, okay, for every V. So that comes from the definition. And so we have a bound here, yeah, because if we apply this to this uh, sequence, here is omega cross Y, of course, where T epsilon lives. If we apply this to this sequence, then first should be bounded by the norm of the gradient which is bounded by a constant, 
because uh, u epsilon solves our PV, so we need that bound. And that means that if I have a bounded sequence, by now we know that compactness will help us to extract the weakly convergent subsequence. Yeah? So there will be some weak limit on a subsequence. But as you know, passing to the limit on subsequences is fine in homogenization as long as you get at the end the limit problem which has a unique solution. Because then, as Patricia pointed out, Every sequence which has uh, the property that every subsequence converges to the same limit has the same limit. So this is Urison uh, lemma. Yeah? Yeah. So you can apply that if you identify the final limit. So let's stay on the subsequence without calling it differently. And so based on this, there is a subsequence in which there is a limit. Okay. Let's call it something uh, W. Okay. And this is a weak limit in the space where it lives, okay? Good. So now, uh, what can we say about W? Well, we know that if the unfolding weakly converges to W, then the sequence here, this will be weakly convergent to the average, we proved that, yeah, of W. We know that this is weakly convergent to the it is, uh, strong in L2 and weak here in H1. Uh, okay, so this is uh, this means that the gradients are weakly convergent in L2 to the gradient. Okay, so so we know that this uh, has a weak limit. So somehow this is the best we can say right now about about T epsilon gradient U epsilon. Now, one wild guess would be to say that T epsilon gradient U epsilon weakly converges to the gradient of U zero, no? That would be, uh, well, the first guess one would have if one is uh, sincere uh, with uh, oneself. Uh, but uh, if you do that, if you assume that guess, uh, you pass to the limit immediately because you have weak, strong. Uh, this doesn't matter. You pass to the limit in the problem and you get what? This is the limit problem. You would get. So you pass here weak to U0 using this assumption. Of course, this is a question mark. Uh, because right now it's a, an educated or uneducated assumption. And so the limit here is uh, A, the limit of this times the limit of this. And then uh, nothing depends on Y but A. So this is uh, uh, integral, the average of A, anti zero gradient psi equal with, so pretty much U zero satisfies the problem where the coefficient in the limit would be the average of uh, A. And uh, we know that this is not true, uh, even in the one-dimensional case. So I recommend you to read uh, the one-dimensional discussion in uh, Patricia's and Doina's uh, book, uh, section 5.3. Uh, anyway, convince yourself that this is not a good assumption. So this, this is, cannot be true, so this is not true, okay? Well, if that's not true now, what you can do? You go back to square one and you are in the blind. Or you can say, okay, it doesn't converge to this, then, uh, then it makes sense to, uh, to look at this, no? Okay? So we'll look at this and see what's going on. T epsilon uh, gradient U epsilon minus the gradient of uh, U zero, okay? So far, so good. So let's see. Let's take a look at this to see what's going on with this. Now, um, if I'm looking at uh, this, what is this? T epsilon of uh, gradient is uh, 
the gradient of u epsilon evaluated by definition wherever is not zero yeah, is that. So I'll keep uh, writing this, although we know it has is defined with zero on the on the small set. But I'll just keep uh, this shorthand notation. Uh, okay. Now there is a relation, uh, and it's very easy change of variables. It's very easy to observe that if you look at again recall the definition of the unfolding of uh, u epsilon, you will see that this is related to the derivative with respect to y of this. You can derivate with respect to y. And if you derivate with respect to y, then uh, you have, well, the chain rule here. There will be an epsilon times gradient of u epsilon evaluated in the argument. OK? So the relation between the unfolding of the gradients and the gradient of the unfolding is observed here. If you look at these two first and third relations, then you see immediately, no, you see that uh, T epsilon of gradient U epsilon is, uh, uh, so it's just this part, so it's 1 over epsilon gradient respect to Y T epsilon of U epsilon, OK? okay? where, of course, uh, both sides depends on x and y. But I omitted. Uh, now we're familiar with this notation, so I'll uh, omit writing x and y when it's not uh, so uh, relevant. So this is the relation. So what I observe here, so again, I never look, I never forget what I'm about to study. This limit, this is my limit. Basically, this is the what, what uh, should be the new contribution of the microstructure, because otherwise, if this limit is zero, I know that I get, uh, I get something which is not true, OK? So I'm studying this. In studying this, I look a little bit. I see uh, the gradient. So one observation is this, OK? This is one observation, that T epsilon of gradient of U epsilon is, in fact, itself a gradient with respect to Y, OK? The problem when you look at this, Let's make an effort and look at this, OK? The problem when you look at this is that one function lives in xy space, and the other lives in x space, OK? So uh, every time you, uh, and, uh, uh, for this problem, for the toy problem, and for the classical homogenization problem, we deal with, with uh, limits because we have bounds, and we have bounds either in L2 norms or on gradients, OK? Now, Nothing about the xy space where the unfolding lives, OK? We do have a bound in the xy space for the L2 norm of the unfolded. But that's pretty much uh, where we are. So we're trying to make them live in the same world. So first observation is that this guy, the first guy, the T epsilon of gradient of epsilon, is a gradient itself. Now, it would be great if we can make this a gradient with respect to y. OK? And uh, well, how do you make uh, uh, think one dimensional? You have a function of x. How do you make it a gradient with respect to y? In one dimension, if I have a function of x and I want to make it a gradient with respect to y, uh, I just do this. No? It's, uh, in one dimension, it's a derivative, yeah? OK? So uh, I can make this a gradient with respect to y by dot multiplying with y. Okay? So that's the, the observation. So in fact, the expression I'm looking at can be rewritten. This will be this. So it's 1 over epsilon gradient with respect to y. minus this, which is the gradient with respect to y of y dot, OK? That's it, OK? So now I'm, I'm playing with two gradients, OK? Now, in order to be able to say anything about a limit whatsoever, uh, so again, now if you look here, you have a gradient 
So this would be equal. Now let's write it compact. It is equal with a gradient with respect to i of a big thing, one over epsilon t epsilon u epsilon minus y dot gradient u zero. Okay. Okay. That's what we have. And so. Uh, it lives in a space which admits gradient to do i, so we can say that this would uh, indeed live in uh, L2 uh, omega h1 of y, because it has gradient with respect to y, and this L2 omega cross y, so heuristically I could say that uh, it lives here, okay? But uh, now, again, in order to pass to the limit in anything in these courses, we needed compactness. So what we need now is a bound on this. So we need a bound on this. Uh, Okay, to be able to pass to the limit. So, uh, but this will not be actually enough. A bound on this will pass to the limit with the gradients, but you see, in a space H1, to be able to pass to the limit, you need, if you remember what Patricia said and all the other speakers before, in H1, to be able to pass to the limit, you need a bound on the gradient and the bound on the L2 norm. So we need to bound both quantities, okay? Okay, the first one is bounded for free, why? Because it's this. And this is bounded in L2, and this is bounded in L2, so this here is bounded. It's just a notation we did, we didn't do anything. This is the problem, because I have a one over epsilon which screams in my face, so I need, so this, we agree that this is bounded? We agree, but it's not enough to pass to the limit because it's only the gradient, okay? So in order to pass to the limit in spaces like this, I need to bound the L2 norm as well. How do I bound the bottom part? That's the question. How do I bound this? You know? So, I know you may not be familiar with uh, the world of PDEs, but you remember what we did last time when we proved the bounds of the solution, we used something called Poincaré inequality. And, um, well, now we'll use a, an extension of that inequality, which is Poincaré of Rittinger inequality. And what it says, it says that uh, the minute, so we are in the product space, but again, we're looking to bound in spaces which admit derivative with respect to y. So, the minute we, uh, uh, we can have, uh, we, we can look at the function minus uh, uh, the average with respect to y. And these expressions here for functions in this space are bounded in their L2 norm by the gradient of this uh, function, okay? So this is the Poincaré uh, uh, written here inequality. And so the gradient now will come like that. So basically, this tells us that I can control the L2 norm of functions minus their average on the y with the norm, the L2 norm of the gradient. That would be great in our case uh, because we have a norm on the gradient. Well, we, we don't need uh, really, we don't uh, really need, uh, uh, this will tentatively will be something extra, but let's see what it gives us, okay? Right now, uh, we, this is our expression. We look to, to, uh, to bound this in L2, but let's see its average. What is its, uh, its average? So, because uh, in order to apply Poincaré everything inequality, I need to take my expression minus its average, and I bound it with the gradient, okay? So, I'm looking at the average of this.
Okay? I'm looking at the average of this with respect to i. Well, and uh, let's see. So uh, is 1 over epsilon the average with respect to i of um, t epsilon, u epsilon, that's the first here, of x and y with respect to y, so it's a function of x here, uh, and, uh, and then minus the average with respect to y, and to simplify computation now, we'll assume that y is unit cube, yeah? Just, uh, uh, but you can do it immediately. This is a dot product between y and the gradient, okay? And the, the average with respect to y falls only on y here, so we know it's like uh, y squared over two, yeah, for every component. So it'll be the vector with all components equal to in the zero one interval, no? What is this? Hmm? So I'll copy the first. Is the average with respect to the unit cell of the unfolded. With respect to y, minus this would be, again, gradient falls out. So is the, the, the average with respect to y, if y is the unit cell, this doesn't matter. It's integral from 0 to 1 of y on all components, which is 1 half. Yeah? So it's all the vectors, the vectors with all components equal to 1 half. Well, if you are in n dimension or, uh, and multiply with the gradient. That's what we have, okay? Now, what about this? This is the so-called local averages, when you average the unfolding uh, with respect to y. So let's talk a little bit about this. It's a simple operator introduced uh, 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 in the paper of uh, Damlamian, Choronescu, and Griso. It has many other properties. It's very useful in the numerical uh, error estimates procedure. But here, it's, uh, two, simple, two of its simple properties are relevant for our limit process. So first of all, we define this. Uh, for any function to be exactly this, the average with respect to i of the unfold. Okay? You can define it like that, and you can see it's in fact a local average because the change of variable, if you apply the definition here of the unfolded, again, whenever x is in the interior set, but we will disregard the small set which uh, vanishes in the limit. So uh, this will be this. Okay. And now a change of variables. If you restrict, if you restrict x, so again, x is in the interior set. Interior set is union of epsilon y translates. Okay. So for, for every, uh, uh, for every x, y pair in one of, uh, one of the cells of this uh, uh, union, okay, if you fix, for example, uh, fix x to be in some epsilon p plus epsilon y cell, okay, where p is some integer, okay, p is some integer in the interval uh, uh, containing only the integers such that the translates of epsilon y are inside omega. You remember we defined this interval at the first lecture. So if you fix an x there, then this operator is in fact a local average because here you can change variables. I keep uh, the measure the measure of y here, but in the unit cube is one. I just keep it just for symmetry purposes because you can do the problem for any type of cell with paving uh, property. So for this x, then the average is in fact phi computed in epsilon p plus epsilon y, the, uh, in, uh, the average of phi with respect to y uh, restricted to that cell. And here you do a change of variables. And you have, uh, let's see, so uh, d uh, x will be epsilon to the nth dy. So you have an epsilon to the nth falling out. And uh, the integral will be on the new cell, epsilon p plus epsilon y of phi of x. So you see now that the local operator, the, the, the uh, average of the unfolded, 
is in fact, when restricted for x in each of the interior epsilon y cell, is a local average. That is the average of your function on the small cell. Everybody sees that? So that's, this, that's why this is called the local average operator. So going back to our, to our discussion here, so there you go. This is what uh, uh, um, this operator has uh, some properties, as I said. Um, one important property is that is invariant with respect to T epsilon, so you can prove this just by using the definition that T epsilon applied to M epsilon of phi, which is a function of X itself. So you can apply T epsilon to M epsilon, yeah? This is a function of X itself. You can do the definition, by definition you can show that this is, uh, you get uh, the invariance property. So this is, there are some other properties of M epsilon, boundedness, um, and other properties which again are important in uh, the finite element, the error estimate uh, analysis uh, associated with the unfolding, but right now we don't need it. So now going back to our business, again, remember what we wanted. We wanted to bound this in L2. In order to bound in L2, we decided to apply Poincare everything in inequality, so we computed the average, okay? And now we're back where we can uh, write some things, so about that. So let's see, what do we have? We'll uh, wrap up the thing. So we're looking at this object. Okay, and we saw that this is, um, uh, gradient of y of one epsilon t epsilon u epsilon minus y gradient u zero. And, um, and now we have a bound, we have a bound. Now this expression here, this leaves in L2 with, uh, uh, it's a vector space with derivatives in Y. So we have a bound for its gradient. And the, the gradient with respect to Y, so this bound uh, um, we have a bound from the definition, so that's what we wrote here. And here, we need to apply Poincare everything in equality, so we take it, and we proceed exactly as it says there, okay, in the inequality. So the object minus its average with respect to y, the average with respect to y, it's here, so we have one over epsilon, m epsilon, uh, u epsilon, yeah? This is m epsilon, u epsilon, yeah? That's how we define it. Minus the vectors with one half all components applied dot product with uh, u0. This is its average, so that's what we need to subtract there. So, and minus minus plus that vector with one, two all over. So this is uh, the object minus its average, okay? And this is bounded is bounded by uh, the gradient, which you know will be bounded. So now let's see what we get at the end. So this is bounded by the gradient, based on Poincare everything in inequality, yeah, the gradient, and we know this is bounded. So now we have a bound for a sequence, and this bound, this bound, this sequence is lives in L2 omega h on y, and now I have bound on L2 omega y uh, norm and on the on its gradient, so we can say that this sequence here, this guy, we group the terms. We group this with this, the one over epsilon terms, and this, the gradient u zero terms. So we have now a sequence. Let's call it uh, B epsilon, which is one over epsilon T epsilon U epsilon minus the average. 
plus, now we group these two, so it will be uh, minus y minus this vector. No? Minus minus plus there, okay. Dot product with a gradient of u0. This here, this sequence, of course, we know that by definition lives in this space, but it's also bounded in this space now, okay? So I bound, it's not exactly my initial sequence because I added these two constants, okay? So I have a little bit of change, but nonetheless, I, uh, this is bounded. So based on the Poincaré rooting at inequality, okay? It's bounded with respect to epsilon, yeah? So I can pass to the limit, okay? So B epsilon has a weak limit on a subsequence. And let's call this weak limit omega hat uh, in uh, L2 omega H1 of Y. Okay. One thing immediately you can observe is because the way this is constructed, what is the average with respect to Y of B epsilon? Well, here I subtract from this, I subtract its average. From this, I subtract its average, so the average of BS on with respect to Y will be zero. So based on construction, immediately you see that the average with respect to Y of omega hat is zero by construction, okay? Our business now is to see, again, to see how this helps us to answer our question here, finding a weak limit of this, okay? So let's see. Right now, this is where we are, okay? So, so far so good? Any questions? Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on then. Okay. So let's, uh, our initial question was this. So passing to the limit in this gradient, we kind of have an answer because if B epsilon weakly converges to gradient to uh, W hat uh, in this space, that means it weakly converges, uh, it strongly converges in L2 omega cross Y due to the compactness, but it's weakly, uh, there is a weak convergence uh, of the gradients. Gradient of this weakly converges to gradient of this, yeah? So, so if you take a look now, what is the gradient of y with respect to b, uh, uh, the, the gradient with respect to y of b epsilon? Well, this doesn't depend on y. This does depend on y. Those are averages. So it's exactly my initial expression, yeah, which is what I want to uh, find the limit of. So in a first approximation, we have that t epsilon gradient u epsilon minus gradient u zero converges with respect to epsilon weakly to the gradient uh, uh, with respect to y of omega hat. So on a subsequence, you have that now the limit of the gradient is in general uh, weak in L2 omega cross y, yeah? Weak in L2 omega cross y. The limit of the gradients is in general, in a weak sense, um, gradient u0 plus something additional which better have something to do with the microstructure, okay? It's because the, the only new thing which my problem has with respect to any other simple problem is the presence of the microstructure, yeah? So, now, this is on a subsequence, but my quest now, the only thing I know about omega hat is that it has average zero. My quest is to identify it, okay? So, so, uh, uh, I know it belongs to the space. Ah, sorry. And it has average zero, okay? So I know that by construction. Now, this is a, a major point in our uh, presentation, and I would like to make sure that 
uh, you followed. So please let me know if you didn't, because if you didn't, then going further will be a little bit uh, sad for you. <laughs> so, you know, you need to be on board with this. So everybody follow, don't be afraid. If you didn't, we'll, yes. So here, okay, so now let's go, uh, let's go from where, from, uh, from here. You understood how we constructed this sequence? It's our guy, yeah, minus, no, we started from here. This is a gradient. This is an object in this space. Now, we want to bound it, so what I do, I look at this itself, uh, itself, minus its average, okay, with respect to y. I apply Poincare everything in inequality, and I get this bound. So far, so good? Okay. Now. This is my object, which I have a bound on, on a bound on this space. So compactness tells me that it has a weak limit. I call it whatever you want to call it, okay? But I keep this notation so you can follow the paper too. Okay, omega hat. By construction, the average is zero, because that's what I did. I, I took something and I subtracted its average, so by construction it is zero. Now, here, what does this limit mean? It's a weak limit in this space. What it means is a strong limit in omega cross y and the weak limit of the gradients in L2 cross y. Huh? So the weak limit of the gradients, so far so good? Huh? Now what is the gradient? Well, the gradient, because look at how I constructed. When I apply the gradient with respect to y, this is constant, this is constant, and I apply the gradient only to this portion and to this portion, y times, uh, and it's by construction, is my object. So the gradient of B epsilon is my object, okay? So that means this weakly convergent to this will be equivalent to this because this is in fact the gradient, okay? Converging to this. And now it's just uh, algebra, okay? Good? So we are on board, everybody? Good. Then now we can move further and identify this because so far, but we have something so far, no? We can pass to the limit. We have a weak limit. I have no idea what W hat is, so I can pass to the limit and call it a day, but it's useless, okay? Because when you pass to the limit, the whole purpose of this is to replace the composite with something which is computable, useful, and so what we need at the end of the day, we need to be able to have a limit problem with an identifiable coefficient uh, Function or matrix, if you talk about more general situation, okay? So we cannot just stop here. We need to identify omega hat. Okay. Okay, so now, what do we do next? Uh, So next, we take advantage, we take advantage that we know what does it mean for T epsilon applied to a sequence to weakly converge to some other sequence, to, to, to a limit. You remember? If T epsilon, I'll remind you, of V epsilon weakly converges with V epsilon bounded, weakly convergence to some V, you remember what, uh, that's how we used, uh, what we used to produce uh, a, a shorter proof for the Lebesgue-Riemann lemma. What does it happen with V epsilon? This tells me that V epsilon is weakly conversion to the average of V, okay? Okay? Now, let's look at my result here. I know that T epsilon of gradient U epsilon conversions to something, so I can apply this, and that tells me, so I, I, I use the result, which I just proved, Okay, I use the result which I just proved, and this tells me what about gradient of u epsilon? That gradient of u epsilon is weakly convergent to the average with respect to i of this guy. The average with respect to i of uh, gradient u0, this does depend on y, plus the average with respect to i of this. 
Okay? Okay? There's no dot here. <laughs> it's the gradient. So now, there's something interesting because I knew from my theory for the PDE bounds that gradient of u epsilon weakly converges to gradient of u0, but there's something else here in the limit. So it cannot be, you know, I have a house of separation, uniqueness of limits, yeah? So they cannot be the same. So this must be zero, okay? So now, this is an indication, not a proof, but an indication that w hat should be and must be periodic with respect to the y variable, okay? That's how you come up with this search now and desire to prove periodicity of w hat, you know? Okay? Patricia, do you wanna, did I say something wrong? Okay, okay, good, okay. No, but please feel free to, you know, jump in. So it's, it's just a perspective, uh, personal perspective on the, on the, on the thing. Because otherwise you may think, why periodicity? Well, uh, you start with a periodic problem, maybe it makes sense a periodic coefficient, but you'll see that it's not so uh, out of nowhere, okay? It's an indication here in the, in the, in the tools we obtained so far. So now let's show, let's see if we can show W hat, uh, that W hat is periodic. Well, this is, a bit technical, okay? But uh, 38 minutes, so yeah, we'll, we'll try to do this uh, step by step. So, so far so good? We know uh, uh, what, yes? Well, no, it doesn't. The unfolding doesn't weakly converge to nabla u0, it has this term. What I'm using here is a property we proved in the previous lecture, which says that if the unfolding of a sequence weakly converges to some limit, then that sequence has itself a weak limit, which is the average of the limit. You know, this is the property we use. Uh, you understand? So again, I want, I want you to, to, uh, to everybody to clearly see that this is the limit we have for the unfolding of the gradients. It's not uh, the gradient, but there is something else. The problem is now we're trying to identify this, and the only tool I could see available to us is to use the information which unfolding gives us when it has the weak convergence property. If it's weakly convergent to something, then the sequence has the property that is weakly convergent as long as it's bounded, which is the case for our sequence, weakly convergent to the average of the limit. Again, here. So, yeah. That's what we apply here. We have T epsilon clear? I, I don't, I don't, uh, well, uh, right now, this is not a proof of periodicity, but it's a strong indication. Okay? So that, I, wh why did I do this? Because if you look in the paper, it appears like uh, now we prove that W hat is periodic. And uh, I just want to introduce you to the, where the idea comes from. It's a very organic thought now. It makes sense to think that this should be periodic, okay? Now, okay, and it's indeed periodic, but uh, uh, let us prove this, okay? So, uh, okay. Okay, I'll erase the, something I shouldn't do, but I'll erase the last thing. Everybody agree to, to erase this? So we do it on the remainder of the board? Okay. Okay. So, um, so we'll do it on uh, on this. Okay. So now let's show periodicity. Uh, well, okay. So let's get back to W hat. W hat appears here. So the only way to put my hands on W hat is to really play with B epsilon. There's no other way, okay? W hat doesn't leave any other world which I can look at but in the world of B epsilon. So we look at B epsilon and see what's going on. So the idea is uh, we know what we want to look. Periodicity, uh, let's say we are in a space of uh, n variables, three variables if you want. For, so periodicity of W, uh, let's say we have a unit cube. Uh, what is uh, periodicity of W hat? 
It should be periodic in each of the variables. Yeah? OK? So when I look at w hat with respect to y, one thing I want to be able to show is that for every uh, uh, one, uh, uh, two points at length one uh, distance, uh, w hat will be, will be uh, uh, repeating itself, OK? That's what I want to uh, obtain. And I want to obtain this for all um, uh, belonging to, uh, OK? So that's, uh, um, that's the idea. And in general, for every two points, a distance one apart, I want this, uh, the values to be equal. That's the, 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 the idea of the periodicity, OK? Good, so uh, let's focus on this expression. How do I get this expression? Where do I get it from? Again, looking at b epsilon, b epsilon is a function of x and y, but let's see if we can make it. So I know, I know that b epsilon is a function of x and y, and I know that I have a weak convergence in this space, OK? Now there is a crucial point, which I don't know how many of you know. But if you have a, a, a weak convergence in a space which admits for weak derivatives like h1, then there is something called the trace theorem, which tells you that you will have convergences in the integrable sense for traces on the boundaries. OK? So. It makes sense, since I'm looking for information about the traces of the limit, to somehow build up on looking for information uh, on the traces of the sequence. Yeah? Traces of the limit, traces of the sequence. So whatever happens in the bulk world, the trace theorem tells me in the sense of limit, in some weak sense, is translated into the trace world. Okay? So if I have a limit uh, for this uh, space where I have derivatives, yeah, the h1 space. A limit in the weak sense then somehow translates to the traces. So let's see if we can make it work, okay? So we're looking, and I'll use a simplifying notation as the paper. The paper is very complexly written, but it has, it has some good notations which simplify the exposition. Uh, it's very general. It's much general than what we did. So I advise you to look at it carefully. It has a lot of extra things. Uh, but we will define this y1, y2, or the first n minus 1 components as y prime, OK? So we're looking at this type of expression, b epsilon x, y prime 1, b epsilon x, y prime 0. And we look at this type of expression. Of course, we need to uh, uh, look in a limit sense. So we need to multiply with test function, OK? And integrate on omega cross y, uh, using some sort of, uh, using the fact that b epsilon on the trace is convergent, weakly in L2, OK? So this will be the object we look at. Now, if I show that the limit of this is 0, if I show that the limit of this is 0, then do you agree that? That implies that this, uh, the w hat is periodic in the, in the, let's say, in the last variable. Right now, we focus on the last variable only because all the others will be the same, yeah? So just uh, uh, in a uh, yn direction, yeah? But uh, periodicity in the other directions will follow based on the same argument. So do you agree that if this goes to 0, if this goes to 0 with respect to epsilon, if this limit is 0, then this implies that this will be uh, true. Here, I need to focus only, only on, on y prime. Yeah, that is the y prime is the, uh, in three dimensions, the 0, 1 square, yeah, the cube, OK? So if this limit is 0, then uh, because of the trace, this will go to this, this will go to this. And I'm done. Because 
if something multiplied with test functions is zero, then I can conclude uh, the, the identity with zero, okay? So how can I pass to the limit in this expression? That's now my next uh, thing. So now B epsilon has, uh, has uh, two parts. And I'll split it as it is. This is the first part, and this is the second part, okay? Let's take the second part because it's much simpler. Why? There's no epsilon there. So, uh, so the second part, uh, okay, uh, the value in uh, one and the value in zero. So before doing the integral, let us do it by hand. Actually, put it there. So y minus one half, one half, one half in n dimensions, gradient u zero. I need to evaluate this in, well, uh, x, uh, y prime, and one, yeah? And minus, the same thing evaluated, evaluated uh, in uh, x, y prime and zero. This is what I'm looking at, yeah? There's no limit with epsilon. So I'm just looking at this expression. So what does it give me? Well, uh, so here when I evaluate in y prime and one, again, these are one and the very same thing, okay? So if you look particularly, you have, what does it mean? y1 minus one half, y2 minus one half, yn minus one half, okay? Uh, multiplied by the gradient, this is my expression, yeah? Evaluated in y prime, evaluated in y prime and one, forget about x, it's there, would be what? Well, y prime minus, the first n minus one components are y1 prime, y2 prime, well, y1, y2, yeah, uh, minus one half. And the last component now is one, so one half. And now when I evaluate the same expression on this, when I evaluate the same expression on uh, y prime and zero, the bottom part, the bottom phase, I get what? Well, I get exactly the same as here, y1 minus one half, y2 minus one half, but now evaluated in zero is minus one half, yeah? So when I subtract them, again, remember that this is a dot product. So the first component times the first component, second times the second, n minus one times n minus one, same here and here. When I subtract them, they vanish. The only thing which is different is the last component, which I have one half times the last derivative of u zero minus minus one half times the last derivative of u zero. So it's one half plus one half. So here, this thing would be integral on omega cross y prime. Um, and now I need to multiply in order to, I need to multiply with the test function. It's integral. This expression now here is just the last derivative of u zero, yeah? Uh, okay. So this is uh, this is uh, this term part of this difference. Okay, that's part of the difference. Now we need to deal with the first part of the difference. Uh, well. Okay. So the first part of the difference. We'll go, actually it's not, uh, I don't, I'm not doing like Fermat, it doesn't fit there. So um, I need to erase uh, a larger part of the board.
Okay. Bear with me. We'll soon be home. Um, okay. So now I'm looking at the other part, which is uh, 1 over epsilon t epsilon of u epsilon minus the average. Evaluated in x, y prime, and 1, yeah? Minus the same thing. Evaluated in x, y prime, ah, and 0. Multiplied by psi of x, y prime, dx, dy prime. Now there is some epsilon I want to pass to the limit. I hope, I hope. If I didn't make any sign mistake, if I did, then uh, too bad you didn't correct me. I hope that uh, it'll be, uh, uh, the limit will cancel this, OK? OK, so uh, I guess we had 1 plus the other, no? or minus the other. You should remind me at the end, but let's see. So uh, now, one thing immediately is the local average doesn't depend on, uh, on y. So the fact that I'm evaluating in 1 and 0 doesn't really matter. So this will cancel. OK? OK? So now I just have this minus, uh, minus uh, uh, that. OK? So 1 over epsilon integral. I make abstraction that t epsilon is 0 in the thin set. I just write the definition as it will be. OK, now here it should be epsilon y prime and 1, yeah, because I'm evaluating here. Yeah, everybody with me? You still with me? Good. So, so this disappears. This, 1 epsilon outside, OK, minus here I evaluate u epsilon in uh, this, y prime and uh, 0. I multiply everything with the test function. And uh, proceed. So let's see. One problem here is that there is a difference in, uh, you know, I can't really um, uh, do too much at this point from the point of view of the limit because uh, u epsilon is not. Uh, you know, it doesn't allow me to pass the limit. So the ideally, I would be able with a change of variable to pass everything into the psi argument. Why? It's intuitive. I know what I'm expecting. I'm expecting to get something which gives me uh, uh, here, uh, uh, well, something which deals with the, with the derivative with respect to the last variable uh, into that product. Okay, so, so let's see. Uh, so what I do, I group them a bit, this and this and this and this, so break the integral. Now here is epsilon y prime and 0 plus epsilon and 0, 1. You just divide the, you know, break the psi of x y prime, dx dy prime. I'm just looking at the first part, yeah? Now, here, I just put this in here because I observe that epsilon times the integer part of x with respect to y plus epsilon 0, 1, this is an integer. OK, well, 0 prime, yeah? All the other components and 1 at the last. This is an integer. So it's, in fact, epsilon x. Uh, uh, plus epsilon en, where en is uh, the unit vector of the canonical basis in Rn. This is that, OK? Everybody sees that because this will get out uh, of the integral part immediately. You're just adding an integral, and the integral part for something plus an integer uh, will be uh, uh, unaffected, will be shifted by the integer. So this relation here. I use here. So going on, just for this part of the, this piece, this times this. Going on will be uh, 
Let's see. So uh, I have u epsilon evaluated in epsilon integer part of x plus epsilon en over epsilon, okay, plus epsilon uh, epsilon y prime and zero, okay. So that's times psi. And now I'm just changing variable with respect to x. Again, remember, psi is a test function which is smooth in x and, uh, and uh, uh, y. So you can, you can uh, uh, use that later on after the change of variable. So let's call this x tilde. So if I call x tilde, then, uh, then there's nothing changes. Uh, x plus uh, uh, epsilon uh, n plus en uh, is x tilde, nothing changes but the shift. So what will happen is that I will have, instead of omega, I will have, well, if x was in omega, this should be an omega shifted. Okay, and then the argument is this. Now I change x with this, so this is okay. Um, hmm. Okay, uh, I forgot the y prime here. Okay, everybody with me? Did, did I make any mistake? No. Let me know because now it's a bit technical if I make a mistake. Okay, so um, okay, so now one key observation because, as I said, psi is smooth domain. What does it mean? psi is a smooth function, so it has compact support. So compact support means that its support, the set where it's not zero, is some something compactly embedded in omega. Okay, so shifting for epsilon. Remember always that our epsilon is very very small. Uh, so shifting with a small quantity, left, right, up, down, doesn't really matter. It doesn't really affect the integral, okay? So in fact, this is equal with the integral on omega because psi doesn't see anything out, it's outside its support, okay? So convince yourself, if you're not totally convinced about this right now, convince yourself with a short meditation, you should become convinced, okay? So this is uh, the cosmetic changes I did to this part and now I'm going back to the uh, square one and look at what I tried to prove. So I'm having this minus this. This I didn't do anything with it. I copy. So then my, uh, my quantity, which I started with, well, uh, I'll go with the equal sign starting from here. So it's equal to 1 over epsilon integral on omega cross y prime. Now. This times the test function, I rewrite it as this. So it's uh, u epsilon, because look, here I, I omitted, uh, you know, I, I changed the variable, so everything is with respect to x tilde, yeah? So uh, it's a dummy variable, so I can call it x again. That's what I did, and now this multiplies a function which is computed in x minus epsilon e and y prime. This is the first part minus the second part, which I just copy. The second part. So do you see the, um, the end is within sight or? Uh, no. Hmm? Now I can bring them together again, factor this because it's the same. And what I have is integral on omega cross y prime, u, and this is nothing else but the unfolding. This is the unfolding of u epsilon uh, evaluated in y prime and zero. And multiplied by this minus this. Now, the one over epsilon goes here, of course. So what I end up with is what? What is this? 
This in the limit when epsilon goes to zero, this is the unfolding. This is T epsilon, U epsilon evaluated in X, Y prime in zero. So it goes to, in the limit, this goes to uh, U zero. No, the limit of the unfolding. Actually, uh, sorry, omega hat. Yeah? Omega hat of X, Y prime in zero. Okay? And this here, uh, that's actually should be U zero. So let's see. T epsilon, U epsilon, U epsilon goes to U zero, so this goes to U zero of X, does depend on, and this should go to what? When uh, epsilon goes to zero, this goes to minus uh, the derivative of psi with respect to Xn, no? Evaluated in the, the right things, okay? Evaluated in uh, uh, X, Y prime. So this thing goes to that. So. The first part of my B epsilon goes to this, and minus the second part, which was this. They appear different, but I can use the fact that I is smooth and uh, integration by parts with respect to x. So this is minus integral of omega cos y prime, u0, d c, dxn, xy, dx dy prime. I want to tell you that what I did right now it's just technical stuff, very simple to carry on if you understand the gist of the problem. What I want you to understand is why we look for periodicity, how you prove it, it's just apply the definition. So now you, you have that, the first part minus the second part, they cancel out, so you get indeed that this goes to zero, and if it goes to zero, we know also on the other hand that its limit, well I erased it, is here. Its limit was uh, this difference of W hat, multiplied by the test function, arbitrary test function, so W hat is periodic in the n direction. Repeat the thing in all the n minus one directions, so you get periodicity. So at the end of the day, now we pass to the limit in the problem. We have 12 more minutes, so we'll go back to our problem. Okay, uh, we'll unfold it here and march along uh, with a smile on our face, but I wanna see how many of you follow this uh, technical uh, periodicity proof. Raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Yeah. What is that? I don't hear. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the question is why? I, I, I still don't understand the question. The, the, inter, the average with respect to y is zero because of the construction of the sequence of B epsilon. Where it is used. Yes, yes. We, we, will, we will make use of it right now. It's important in the, in the uh, well poses of the limit, but I didn't get the limit problem. So I'm about to do that right now, okay? So uh, right now my question is, okay, even if you didn't follow this very technical derivation, you can do it at home if you understand the, the principle. So but right now we have that W hat is average zero periodic, so we can pass to the limit. So let's go and pass to the limit. Remember we unfolded our problem and we pass to the limit in the unfolded formulation. And passing to the limit has another trick to it. So, our unfolded formulation of the limit problem, T epsilon A epsilon, that's A of Y, solve that problem. T epsilon grad, T epsilon grad equal with F psi. Now pass to the limit here, this is weak, gradient U zero plus gradient Y W hat. This goes uniformly to gradient psi. So one, one uh, if we choose test function psi smooth, then we get the limit, one limit problem here, A of y, uh, gradient u0 plus gradient uh, w hat, uh, gradient c, dx dy, equal with, okay? 
where w hat is periodic and average zero. But this is not enough, uh, you know, to prove, uh, it, it, it's really not enough to uniquely identify u0 as a solution of a limit problem because this is a formulation which links both u0 and w hat. So for this, you need to choose also another set of test function here, and this is the major point, actually, uh, uh, one of the major points that you can use as test function psi, again, in the formulation, you can use psi of x as uh, uh, epsilon times phi smooth times uh, key, uh, well, let me, let me not use this, uh, uh, z of x over epsilon, okay? Where z is periodic extended by periodicity to the whole space. Why is this key? You can just use this blindly. The problem, property, a very hidden property, which is, I recommend you to look in the Patricia Sendoina's book, which you use here, is that this is uh, uh, in, in, uh, in H01 of omega. That is, if you have a smooth function, but times with a function which is periodic, uh, uh, let's say uh, in, in H1, periodic extended by periodicity to the whole space, it stays in H1 locally. In, our, in Rn, okay? The extension by periodicity keeps H1 properties locally. This is huge here, because otherwise you cannot use this as a test function. So think about this if you have a chance. The proof is uh, not uh, hard, but uh, technical. So um, we can use this. Using this in the, in the limit then gives us another property. Another piece of information which is important. So this is one piece of information. Now using psi of this form in the unfolding, we have A uh, T epsilon grad U epsilon. Now T epsilon of gradient of psi. Here, gradient of psi, if you do the gradient, we'll have epsilon gradient on the smooth function times this high Lewis racing function, plus epsilon phi gradient falling on this, again, stays in H1, so I can apply gradient, will give me one over epsilon gradient with respect to I of Z evaluated in X over epsilon. Yeah? So, um, uh, so we have here two uh, unfolded applied to two uh, type of functions, epsilon gradient phi Z plus epsilon phi gradient z, no epsilon here, because epsilon with epsilon cancels out here on the last. So this, now you can pass to the limit, and here again, psi is epsilon phi. You can pass to the limit, this goes to zero. You have epsilon in front of it, and everything else goes to bounded things. Uh, here, this thing with epsilon will go to zero because of the epsilon there. So the only thing which remains valid is this. So in the limit, let's see, uh, one more step. So uh, uh, I'll just copy just to do one more step. I, I, I forget about the terms with epsilon because they will disappear in the limit. I'll just keep the, the terms which are, is, are meaningful. So it's uh, this one. And I know how the unfolding acts on uh, uh, functions like this. Okay, this will disappear in the limit. I'll put zero. The unfunction acts on, unfolding acts on function like this by eliminating the epsilon. So in the limit, what I have, the other piece of information is this. This weakly converges to this. This here will give me Something like this, okay? That's how the unfolding acts on this function, okay? Now, this is the second part of my limit information. You add them up, this and this together, add them up, and you get the final formulation where you use the fact that you have zero average for a unique solution. So the final formulation is the formulation in a two-scale sense, in the unfolded sense, uh, on the product space. So the formulation will be on H01 omega cross L2 omega H1 y periodic 
and here with the zero average, yeah? And uh, again, it's this plus this. You add them up, okay? So you have and use the density here uh, uh, of this product to replace it with functions of this uh, form. And the limit is this. So let's look at this just for a second and uh, recognize the lax milgram uh, formalism. And then, well, I'll leave it here for the day. So, um, so I have grad C and, well, uh, plus here is the gradient of functions like this, no? So a phi times z, function of x, function of y, they form a, uh, uh, their span is dense in this space, and then here I end up with a gradient of functions in the space. So, and equals, this is zero plus the right-hand side here, so I have, and this is for all psi and phi in my space. Now, this is the limit problem. Everything we did on subsequences, if I identify a unique solution, I'm good to conclude that the whole sequence convergence to, to U0 and U0 satisfy this problem, not for itself, with, together with W hat right now. But if I cannot conclude a unique solution, I'm doomed, okay? If, uh, limiting on a subsequence is bad because every subsystem can have a different limit and uh, that's the end of our homogenization story. So, does this have a unique solution? in this space. Well, it's a variational formulation, simple variational formulation. In a, in a Hilbert sense, you can use uh, uh, lax milgram theory and you can prove coercivity of this functional by using periodicity of W hat. Boundedness is clear there. It's a simple exercise to show that this has a unique solution uh, with the condition that W hat has zero uh, average. If not, then you need to uh, prove, you prove uniqueness on classes, okay? So up to a constant, okay, with this bit one. Um, now from here, another homework would be to go, and of course, <laughs> we started with the problem for u epsilon, so the question is what is the problem for u0? What problem is u0 solves, okay? And again, I could explain to you if you have, if you're interested afterwards, how you get uh, to the problem for u0, uh, but the trick is to look for a particular ansatz of this, what, uh, this uh, w hat, which comes additional, and uh, the ansatz will be to look at it as a uh, product between the partial derivative of u0, the limit solution, and some, uh, um, uh, sorry, and some uh, um, uh, corrector functions, okay? So we can, uh, well, you can try to plug this in and uh, you get the U0 problem, the solution for the functions. The final matrix will be a matrix dependent on solving, uh, well, I equal one to the dimension of the space and cell problems. And uh, the final matrix uh, will characterize the composite again uh, with the help of these cell problems. So this formulation gives you a limit problem for U0 if you carry on, we didn't have time today, uh, as well as, uh, exactly how the microstructure speaks to you at least at the first order level, that is the first order correctness, okay? So I'm sorry I didn't have time to finish exactly as much as I want, but uh, I leave it for questions. Okay, I'll open it for questions now, thank you. <laughs>